Welcome to the first ever episode of the Pitch BTCC show. I'm here with Mark Blundell, ex Formula One driver, ex Le Mans winner, ex British touring car driver, to tell us what happened at the first round of Thruxton just a couple of weeks ago. Joining him is Daniel Rowbottom, who's a driver with the Halfords Racing with Cataclean team, who had a great first weekend. We're interested to see how he got on. One of the big stories from the weekend was a big shunt at the start of race two, which took out three cars, was you know, very spectacular. I'm interested because on social media it was a big story. I'm interested what these guys think about it, but also I'm interested to see, we didn't really hear from Andy Neat during the weekend, so I'd be interested to see what he's done. Now we're a couple of weeks afterwards, let's see exactly what happened to cause that accident. I can't find Andy yet. Is he off at the medical centre, I think? But I'm, I'm with his wife, Natalie Neat, here. So, uh, have you seen Andy yet or not? I have seen Andy. I've seen all three of them, to be fair. Um, they're all okay. Not happy, but they're okay. Um, they're, they, are, they are back now. Um, he's also spoken to Jade as well, and Jade's spoken to us, and she's all right. And, Gave him a chance to clear a lot of the air, I think, in the back of the car that was from yes last year. So something positive came out of it. Um, but yeah, from what from what I heard and what I could see, Glenn had put the brakes on, and uh, Andy said his throttle got stuck. Was Andy just come trying to pull the throttle back with his foot, but it was stuck. So. Okay, right. Well, sorry to hear. Now the the worst thing is that must be pretty stressful for you watching back on the telly. Yeah, no, it's not nice. Um, you do start to panic. You can still hear it in my voice, yeah, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but as soon as you see him get out of the car, and I saw he was all right, then I was, I was all right. So. Well, that's great. Thanks for talking to us. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that we're looking at that, oh. but uh, the car's coming through, I think. But um, see you later. Thank you. So we've just had a chat with Natalie. Now we're talking to, to her husband, Andy Neat, and we've seen his car just push back into the garage. So horrific looking shunt for, 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 for you guys out there. How did you see it from you? I think it was a racing instant in all honesty. Um, you know, there's, there's clearly a problem in the car as well, but uh, three three of us, I think myself, Jade Edwards and Glyn Getty, we're all literally going through turn one. Uh, Glyn and I are literally on top of each other. Glyn's checked up, I've gone to check up and the throttle body's just stuck. So you can see my feet on the onboard. I've tried to pull the throttle body up, although it's electronic, and it's just kept pushing. It's just kept pushing and um, it's obviously knocked at Glenn sideways. Um, at this point, I'm still motoring towards the, uh, the barrier. It all fell because I can't stop the bloody thing. I'm just standing on the brake, and then the rest is, uh, is what it is. But well, the main, main thing is that you're okay. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, the yeah, thing because yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. worst thing. But I mean, the worst thing from a driver's point of view is, is brake failure or a stuck throttle. Yeah, exactly. We had, we had zero brakes at the start, and uh, we had zero brakes and we were hitting the wall. I'm, I'm trying to pump it, stop thing, and things just pushing on. So obviously, it's an electro electronic issue with the throttle body or something. But um, uh, in all honesty, I'm glad it's happened there, not when we've arrived at the chicane, mm -hmm. when everyone's completely, you know, all that, there's 20 cars literally stopped, because yeah, yeah, I yeah. could have literally ploughed straight through all of them. So, yeah, good. Well, it's good to see you're okay. Yeah, you, yeah. Nat Natalie was a little bit shaken, so you might have to go and get her a, yeah. get her a cup of tea <laughs> with a, cu a couple of sweeteners in it, maybe. Oh, sure she is. I'm sure she'll be fine. <laughs> all right, brilliant. Cheers. Okay, mate. Cheers. All right, thanks very much. Cheers. Cheers. So, having heard from Andy and his wife, Natalie, you know, they were obviously just straight out of the accident situation. It's easy to get it wrong. As we now know, it was a little bit of a mistake from Andy in the respect that he left foot brakes. He hit the clutch rather than the brake. And to be honest with you, I know a lot of people will think, how can possibly a racing driver do that? He's not the first and he won't be the last driver to do that. But guys, what do you think? Mark, what do you think about that situation? Listen, it, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, and, and these things happen. And unfortunately, there's a, you know, a lot of cars that were damaged. So it's a huge cost, but more than anything, you know, the outcome is that nobody got hurt. And for me, that's number one priority. Um, yes, you make driving errors behind a wheel. Yes, people have perception that it should never happen, but it does. You know, you can take Formula One greats. They've stuck it in the barrier on a qualifying lap or they've spun off or they've stuck it in the barrier on the last lap. Things happen. So it's no different than British touring cars. Oh, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I tend to think sometimes Andy gets a bit of bad press, to be honest, because I've seen lots of incidents that tend to all get sort of whirled around on social media. Um, it, accidents happen, and, 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 and touring cars is an accident waiting to happen, really. I mean, that's, that, that's really what, it, what it's all about, and that's why it's so entertaining. Well, listen, you know, as well as me, 
2019, I did my uh, season of British Touring Cars um, at Froxton. I got caught up in something, uh, looking back on it. Did I make an error? I didn't make an error driving, I made an error of judgment because I tried to avoid a bigger accident and did something which to all the other people on the circuit, one, one in particular, felt wasn't right. Um, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, these things happen. Um, so it, it's just a case of like, look, yeah, we'll focus on it, we'll analyze it. I s assume that something's been done about it in terms of punishment, if it's been felt in that way. But at the same time, as I say, number one priority for me, nobody was hurt, you know, on the track, off the track. Yes, damage to the cars, but you can put cars back together. You can't put people back together that easy. Oh, exactly. So that's where I sit. No, I totally agree. And Dan, run me through, I mean, how easy is that? I mean, obviously nobody would ever admit it was an easy thing to do, but actually in the heat of the moment, when you're coming off the line, you've actually only had your left foot over the clutch right from the start. So it's, it's I, I, from my point of view, this could happen. I think for me, people perhaps underestimate the procedures you have in a start procedure for these cars, you know, especially the front wheel drive cars, there's a lot going on. I know for the, uh, for the, for the Honda, I've got a whole button sequence I have to do and I have to watch the lights and I've got to do this and maybe someone will come through on the ear and say, don't forget this. And it's like, oh my God. Is it so, a bit like sort of tapping your head and rubbing your stomach? Kind of, and I can't yeah. even do that. So <laughs> so launching a touring car. Not with a, hair like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I kind of echo what Mark says, you know, it, it is an easy mistake, I feel. Um, perhaps I've always left foot brakes. I've come out of go-karts. So my natural, when I try and right foot brake, that's what happens to me. I end up going straight on because I don't hit the pedal with enough pressure. So I think, you know, it's one of those things that's happened. Nobody was hurt. It's a testament to the Toka regulations, really, on how strong the cars are, you know, because it was a fairly big crash. I mean, I looked at Jade Edwards' car afterwards and it had ripped the, it had ripped the anti-roll bar off the front of the subframe, which, you know, for people that don't know, that's sprung steel. So that's under a lot of tension. For that to come off and for no serious damage to be done to anyone, I think was quite, quite a testament, really, to the car. And... We'll all just move on, you know. I think the social media thing gets out of control now. You know, yeah, we, yeah, I, think, I, I think people don't estimate or they underestimate how emotional the BTCC fans are, which is fantastic. But at the same time, sometimes they can go off on this tangent that perhaps, in hindsight, might be a little bit unfair. You know, for sure Andy does get a lot of stick. But if you look at where he was at the start of this year in testing to where he started in 2020, I think there's been massive improvements all around. So... Yeah, let's just all move on now, I think, you know. It, it happened, and unfortunately, I guess the bit that people grudge about is the cost, you know, for those drivers that are bearing a big cost to repair the cars. When they know it was an accident, maybe that magnitude, they're probably a bit, you know, that shouldn't have happened, but it has now, so we'll just move on, I guess. I suppose accidents should never have happened. Of course. But talking about social media, one driver who I know doesn't mind people talking about him is Jason Plato. Well, yeah, and it was sure. great seeing Jason back <laughs> last weekend. Absolutely. And also being sort of back to where he was maybe four or five years ago. Pace-wise, I always thought he, he maybe had lost three or four tenths over the last two or three years. But last weekend, he was right up at the sharp end and also P2 on the podium in the last race. So, Jason Plato back to his old self? I think so. I mean, it, it was, it was for me, it was really good in race two. It was my first race with Jason, I guess. You know, we managed, we did maybe 10 laps together. And I was dreading it, if I'm honest, because he's got a bit of a reputation, that boy, of, uh, of being a little bit rough and ready. But I've got to be honest with you, for most of the guys on the grid that I've now raced with, I found the old guard to be a little bit more respectful, if I'm honest. Like when I was racing in 19, if ever I came across Matt Neal, he was always more than, you know, Matt's got a bit of a reputation, let's, let's face it, for being a bit, a bit of a bruiser. And, um, you know, I've found the old guard to be really, you know, if you race fair with them, they race fair with you. Some of the younger boys are, are in and they're trying to prove themselves. I think we're all trying to prove ourselves. You know, we've all got a lot of sponsorship that we have to fulfill and we have to reward those guys. And sometimes we all make a little bit, you know, over easy mistakes. So to see Jason back and see him at the front was incredible. And, and you know, for me, I'd think more of it, you know, more of it. And the guy's not lost any pace, has he? So, no, that's right. I go. mean, he is a, he is Mr. Touring Cars. For sure. You know, especially now we haven't got Matt Neal on the grid. Got a funny feeling. He was looking a little bit, a little bit lost, I thought, at the weekend. So maybe you'll see Matt back in yeah, next year, maybe. I think but so. But the, the interesting thing is, I, I think that if Jason's back to his, his, you know, his best, if you like, then he's going to be getting results and maybe he'll be able to add to those 97 wins and get up sure. to 100 wins, which is what we like. But, I mean, what do you think? I mean, you know Jason quite well because you, you, you know him off the track as well as yeah. on the track. Yeah. I mean, what's your, what's your view on how long... I mean, somebody, is he 53? I think he's lost a year or two at some point or other. <laughs> don't, don't, don't quote me on that. But, he, uh, but for, for a driver, you know, who's, who's, 
near, near the end of his competitive career, yeah. if you like, um, to keep his enthusiasm going, I think that's probably one of his biggest attributes. You know, I think what's happened is he's had a season off and he's yeah. had a chance to recharge. And um, he's got a bit of focus, he's got a little bit about him that was back to the old Plato. And you know, what Dan says is right, I mean, he's a tough racer. Don't underestimate him, you never should. A uh, lot of experience, he pulled it out the hat. And you know, for me, I was uh, ecstatic. For, you know, he did it for the over 50s. I mean, good on Jason. <laughs> yeah, go for the over 50s. Yeah. <laughs> That's got, and, and also, I mean, he, he's always a good interview. I mean, yes. he's, so my mum always says, why is Pluto <laughs> being interviewed again? I said, the reason is, mum, because he gives a good interview and he for always sure. gives something interesting. You know, and at the end of the day, it is a circus and it's there as entertainment. He's always very controversial. He's very honest as well, I think, yeah. you know, and I think, yeah, it, 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 you need characters in, in any sport, you know, and I think he is one of the true great characters of, B well, he is of BTCC, but of probably motorsport in recent history. So we need guys like that in the championship because without them, it just takes a little bit away from it. So, you know, hopefully, you know, with a, with a, with his age, that gives me 20 years to, to work up to where he is. So there we go. Jobs are good. No, it's good. And then talking about Jason Plato, we've got this interview we did with him at Thruxton a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, yeah, pleased. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I'm a bit annoyed at Cook for getting involved when he had no big, big business to do so. And, you know, because he, he could have been past Hill, but then elected to jump on the brakes and block me at church. That's a bit low rent. It's amazing what two wins can do to your ego, isn't it, I suppose. And, and you'd know all about ego, Jason. I, I, well, in my, in my issue, I call it confidence. He drove, <laughs> he, he drove like a twat, I'm afraid. So that's exactly why Jason Plato is the baddie in British touring cars. After the break, we're going to be going through the young guns who are coming through the ranks who are challenging him for his crown. Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC programme. We just had a little look at Jason Plato doing one of his famous interviews, but the big story from Thruxton as well were the young guns coming through as well. We had Josh Cook with two wins. We had Jake Hill leading the British Touring Car Championship. We had As Sutton with a, with a race win and a couple of unexpected lower grid orders, but a fantastic driver in those sort of conditions. And also Dan Camish, who won't be in the series from now on, but again, showed his pace coming through. But another driver who was back in the British Touring Cars for what will be his second full season is Dan Rowbottom and we got Dan here in the studio. How was the weekend for you Dan? It was great you know it was it was really nice to get back out there it was a bit reserved if I'm honest on Saturday night after qualifying we made a bit of a well I made an error of judgment on tyres in qualifying I just didn't get the slicks on early enough so we'd shown really good pace earlier on FP2 I think we were P3 uh, not too far a flash which is always a good target because flash is pretty on it at the moment I guess. Um, qualified 16th so I was like oh, I you know, made it hard for myself, but we had a great race one, ended up P7. Can and somebody still be called Flash? I think so. That's what he, I'm not sure. That's what he likes to be called Flash. As long as he likes to be called Flash. Likes to be called Flash go, yeah, yeah, I don't know, yeah. I hope so. I'm yeah, down yeah. myself now. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> Maybe explain who Flash is. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah Gordon Shedden, that's better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I just think the fan base will know who Flash is, right? Flash 52, I guess so. That's not his age, that's his race number. So, yeah, so no, it was good. It was nice. It gives me a good wedge, you know, a good marker. Obviously, you know, we discussed Matt's not racing this year, but that's really to my benefit because he's helping with, you know, with a bit of mentoring, a bit of coaching and sort of showing me the way forward. So to reward the team with a P7 and a P4 was great. You know, it was, um, I think, you know, perhaps any doubts they had, maybe, you know, I think if I'm really honest, I think some of the guys in the team were like, oh, we don't really know with this guy. I think they thought I was going to be a, you know, top 10 guy, but lower top 10, maybe, maybe early teens. And I think we've shown the pace that we need to, to get, you know, everybody's support really behind me. You know what it's like. You, everyone has to be pulling in the same direction. You know, you need everybody in the team fighting, fighting your corner. So I think, you know, that they, any doubts have, have been alleviated. And certainly for, for me and for my partners, it was just a, we can breathe, you know, because we had a really hard 2019, you know, and uh, you have to sell your soul to, 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 to raise the sort of money these days to race in a championship like this. And, you know, you when the results don't come in, you am I, am, I, am I really good enough? Can I be here? Can I, you know, do I deserve it? So well, there's always doubt, isn't there? And you always. Have to, I know you have to work really hard off for the sure. circuit. Not to, just me, many drivers. But yeah, to, yeah, for to sure. get the budget together to get out there. But to get a second year, I think is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the, the, 
the championship is very complex. You know, it's not just about driving the car quickly. You need to be clever. You need to understand what happens when you get weight. You need to understand when you want the weight. You need to understand when actually finishing eighth is better than finishing third because you can't carry the weight into the next event. So there's all of this mass, mass information overload that you can't really do it in year one. Um, and I think now I'm coming back, as Mark said before, Jason had a year out last year. I also had a, lot, a year out. So it allowed me to breathe really and go, right, what do I want to do? What do I want to achieve out of this? I do want to win the championship. And if I'm going to win the championship, I need to do it in this way. So it gave us enough time really to, to structure that. So I'm not saying that we're going to win the championship this year, but that's my aim, you know, and I think, I think we'll be, I think after a good weekend at Thruxton, if we can repeat that performance at Snetterton, put ourselves a little bit further up the board, I think, you know, we'll just be consistent and see where we are come Brands Hatch GP. Well, it was a great start to your second year in touring sure. cars. Sure. And then, Mark, you had one year in touring cars and probably could have benefited from a second year as well when you came back. Ma a driver with masses of experience, but not masses of experience in a British touring mm. car. Oh, I think year two would have been a winning season for me. <laughs> there's, there's always a lot of confidence, a lot of confidence. Uh, listen, front wheel drive I found so difficult, I really did. It went against the grain for me in every single area of motorsport that I understood. Um, but fantastic for somebody like Dan, who's having year mm. two and it's shown. Uh, great to have Matt Neal as a mentor, mm. you know, but he's up against some huge talent. For you know, sure. uh, two of those guys are in our team, you know, Jake Hill, Ollie Jackson, fantastic guys, great ability. And, um, you know, Dan talking about winning a championship is exactly the focus for us and our aim, and that's what we're trying to do. So I think people underestimate how tough the British Touring Car Championship is. Um, forget where you've been as a driver and done what you've done. You come into that environment and you know, you've got to play by their rules and you've got to understand it and do your apprenticeship. So I tried, I fouled, you know, it is what it is. Um, will mop up in terms but, of the but, team. So but I do, I do think, you know, it, it, you hit the nail on the head. Front wheel drive is, is, is a black art really. And you know, I, I still look at myself and I go, I don't really get it. I'm just getting better at it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult. And for someone that's raced the machinery that Mark's raced, it's... Listen, it works both ways. For sure. If you ask Matt, he went to Aussie V8s. Yes. He couldn't hit his hat. You know, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You talk about guys like an Andy Prio, you know, the rear wheel drive guys, you know, they come to front wheel drive, struggled. Yeah. You look at guys who go to Porsche, you know, Super Cup, yeah. big names, yeah. can't deliver. You look at guys who go to DTM, yeah. couldn't deliver. It's horses for courses. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm not making any excuses, but I am making an excuse. But <laughs> at the same time, you know, what, what we're talking about is a very, very tough championship. It's the elite championship in the UK. And these guys are good. Don't take anything away from them. They are good. So talking about your experience in the past, I mean, obviously, a, a big career in junior single seaters before you got to Formula One and sports cars, which is what a lot of people know you for. But you had a massive career, re reinvented yourself, really, the other side of the pond over racing in IndyCar. How was that for you? Um, it was great up until my second race, which, um, yeah, I'm not sure about reinventing. I think actually I tried to kill myself. But there you go. It wasn't actually my fault. A technical technical failure. So I had brake failure at uh, Rio de Janeiro, which uh, was the first time that they ran a tri-oval circuit. Uh, interesting layout, interesting concept. Um, I can't advise anybody to strike a wall at 200 miles an hour yeah, yeah. Um, with no brakes, but it's been done and I'm proof. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got some we've got some footage of that accident. If you sort of want to talk talk us through it and, and sort of yeah. let us know exactly what happened. I mean, listen, first and foremost, you know, we were in Brazil. Um, the racetrack was surrounded by concrete walls, so there was no tyres, there was uh, no safety barriers, what you have in modern day IndyCar racing now. Uh, I think top speed we were touching was about 212 miles an hour. For my side of things, I, I came into the last corner and uh, hit the brakes and the pedal went to the floor. Um, so I, I scrubbed off a little bit of speed with that initial impact on the brake pedal. It took me down to 198 miles an hour, and that's the speed that I struck the concrete wall. So I had 122 G impact. That's what got wow. recorded. Um, wow, wow, wow. Not a lot of people would normally... That explains a lot, it, I yeah. mean, <laughs> having known you over the last few years. Listen, I'm okay now. Right? <laughs> so, uh, but you can see, you know, I, I, I actually tried to hit my teammate. Right, you know, right. that's the God's honest truth. Right. Uh, I took the car down onto the, uh, the apron and because uh, I knew I'm approaching concrete at that speed, 
you can imagine sitting in the front of a train and you're coming into the railway station, mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. all you're looking at is where you're going to stop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah? For and sure. that's in, exactly what I was looking at in a race car. So I tried to take the car down, tried to hit my teammate. I thought if I can at least hit him, take some energy out before I get to the concrete, I got half a chance of surviving. Fortunately for Maurizio Guzman, I missed him. In fact, I took the air off the back of his car and moved his car as we went past. Um, I struck concrete. And as I say, 198 miles an hour impact, 122 G. Uh, to this day, I still remember all of it because I was never knocked out. Um, the, the biggest uh, you see there in real time, the impact, I mean, it's like a bullet, but um, the noise that was the biggest thing for me, the, you know, the actual, the actual strike and the noise. But I, I managed to get out um, after I checked my legs because I couldn't feel them. So checking around and like, yeah, they're still there. I, I got out of the car and, uh, and fell down because uh, my foot was fractured in four places and I had knees like basketballs. But actually what went on then was my first instinct was to say to my guys who were with me around the safety crew, tell my team and tell my teammate I've had brake failure. And in fact, it saved his bacon because he got brake tested later on in the race and had exactly the same failure. Wow. And was lucky enough to be up higher against the perimeter wall and slowed himself down all the way around. Unfortunately for me, I didn't get that uh, opportunity. But yeah, big strike, took me out for seven weeks. Um, I shouldn't have got back in a race car as quick as I did, but I was under pressure to do so. A lot of emotions. Uh, I'll be sitting at the dinner table and break down. You know, I've got forearm there that's full of grey hair, more than normal now. But um, that was because of shock that came out. Really? And the other thing as well is, uh, little did I know, after checking out the Brazilian hospital, because back then I had no CAT scan, no MRIs, no X-rays. Uh, I had two paracetamol given to me, and some crutches that Maurizio, my teammate, managed to get his niece to bring into the circuit so that I could walk around. Wow. So the medical uh, backup wasn't that good. And I got back to the UK and I was picked up by my, uh, my late father and I said to him, Dad, I've got the biggest headache of my life. And he's like, I don't like the sound of that. I said, like, and I said like, I'm feeling really off kilter. He drove me straight from Heathrow, straight to Cambridge, Adam Brooks Hospital, went in and an MRI. And the, uh, the surgeons came out, they said, do you want to explain again this, this car accident? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, well, you're a lucky boy. It's more like an aircraft accident. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that was the problem. He said, because you're very lucky. He said, you've got a, a brain clot. He said, no you know, you've got, you've got a hematoma. Okay. Wow. And you should not have been at 35,000 feet on an aircraft. Yeah, yeah. yeah? And uh, that was the consequences of it. So, seat belts five inches longer than what they were manufactured. Monocoque two inches narrower than what it was manufactured. I've still got the remains of the monocoque at home. Oh, really? And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's wow. a memory. I mean, it's got flowers in it now, so yeah. it's great. Yeah. <laughs> but My listen, wife likes it now. <laughs> that's, that's part of a racing driver's makeup. You have the highs and you have the lows. And um, the, the thing for me is I managed to come out of it and I'm still around to talk about it. Wow. Yeah, well, that's great to hear from, from, from this side of, 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 the, uh, of the table because I don't think I'd like to be on... on your side of the table if no. that accident was happening no, 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 it no, looked no, no. horrendous yeah. um, but thanks for the for the input on that but then one of the interesting things about the British Touring Car Championship and the Pitch BTCC program is that we've got the Pitch BTCC app and we've got the uh, driver of the day which the app users can vote for and the driver that they voted for at Thruxton was your driver Mark Jake Hill um, how did you think he did at the weekend? Well, listen, I love the Pitch BTCC app. I think it's great, especially when they vote for our driver. <laughs> um, I, Jake did a tremendous job. You know, uh, teammate 2019 with me. I got to understand him, understand the makeup of Jake as a driver. He's got a huge amount of ability, huge talent. He's now in a, a, a team that's got a platform that he can go to the next level. And, you know, reflective of what Dan's done. He's come into a great team, great infrastructure, and you can see the results now starting to build. So I see that it's going to get stronger for us with Jake, with Ollie Jackson, another great talent, race winner. So I'm looking at good things ahead. Um, if they're not good, I'm going to ask some questions. Yeah, no, definitely. And let's, let's hope they've got some answers. So after the break, we're going to be back with Matt Salisbury, our stat man, and hopefully he'll have some answers for us as well.
Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. My name's Sean Hollenby. I'm joined here by Dan Rowbottom and Mark Blundell, and we've been chatting through things, all things British touring cars, all things Formula One, Indy cars, Le Mans cars, all sorts of things. But a man who knows all the stats about British touring cars is Matt Salisbury from Inside BTCC. Matt, tell us what you know. Well, there's a few interesting things that we uh, picked up from Thruxton from the first weekend of the season. A few of them actually relating to Mark's driver, Jake Hill. Now, Jake was one of the 12 drivers at Thruxton who was in a brand new chassis for the new season. His Ford Focus was the new car built up by Motorbase for this season. And he did a pretty good job in it as well, didn't he? 46 points he scored across the weekend. And if you look back at all the NGTC chassis that we've had in the championship since they first in, were first introduced in 2011, that's actually the third highest point score for a new chassis competing for the first time. You've got to go all the way back to 2012 for the last time that that 46 points was beaten. That was Jason Plato's MG, which scored 52 points first time out, and Matt Neal's Honda Civic. He managed 48 points first time out, and it was Matt on that weekend in 2012 who also took the first NGTC win. Now, 46 points for Jake is his best score on a weekend so far in his BTCC career. Equals the same score Colin Turkington got last year for the opening round. You've got to go back to 2017 and Gordon Shedden for the last time someone scored more in the first three races of the season. And also worth noting with Jake is he picked up three podium finishes at Thruxton as well. We do get that occasionally. We had it a couple of times last season. Uh, Colin Turkington at Snetterton got three podiums. Tom Ingram at Brands Hatch got three podiums as well. But we don't often get it in the opening round of the season. You've got to go all the way back to 2009. Matt Neal scored three podium finishes there. So it's been quite a while since we've seen it. And for Jake, it was certainly a great way to start his season. Well, definitely a great way for the team to start. So the MB Motorsport, you know, supported by Motorbase team. So that, that's interesting to see. But there was also quite a few new chassis on the grid as well. Yeah, like I say, 12 new chassis altogether. That was a little bit of a surprise because we maybe weren't aware that we were going to have that many. We obviously knew Jake was having a new car. We knew that Sicily were bringing in the new BMWs. There's the new Cupras. There was a few new Hyundais as well. But a bit of a surprise when we discovered from the chassis list that Toe could get every season that we were having a new Vauxhall as well. Jason Plato introducing a new Astra with Powermax Racing to replace the car he'd driven previously. That's the car that Dan Lloyd is now driving. And it's actually the car that's done the most starts of any of the chassis on the grid this season. So those were the 12 new cars. Jason actually did a good job as well because the points he scored are inside the top 10 for, for a new chassis as well. But, you know, for Jake in that car to get three podiums, get that many points, and particularly the driving in race three, considering the conditions and he was on slicks, I think that bodes well for Jake and for the team this season. He, he's certainly on for his best year to date. No, so that's good to hear. Were any other drivers have any landmark stats that you can tell us about? Well, there's quite a few landmark races for drivers, one of them being Jason Plato, uh, pretty well documented, I think, across the weekend by the team and, and by the championship that he started his 600th BTCC race in the first race of the weekend, where he picked up a, a solid sixth place finish. And he was just behind a driver who was also celebrating a landmark of his own. Rory Butcher started his 100th race in the championship in that one, and he scored a P5. Colin Turkington, he had his 450th race start in race one. Didn't go quite as well for the Team BMW driver. On the road, it was a good result because he got the penalty for the contact with Ash Sutton that meant he ended up back in P10 instead. Then you've jumped forward to race three. We had the 150th start for Ash Sutton. So he celebrated that in great style with his race win. And Gordon Shedden, 350th start for him. And it wasn't a bad race for him either because he had problems earlier in the day with the accident in race one. Had to come through the grid from 18th in race three, but finished in, in P4. So five drivers with landmarks and all pretty decent performances in those actual landmark races as well. What's interesting there is because we have three races every weekend and 10 meetings over the year, it's quite easy to get to those big numbers. I mean, hopefully, Dan, what, what, what do you know? Remember what number you're on? Uh, you 33 now. 33. 33. Is he right? 
Is that correct? Yeah, he's, right. he's right. He's still in the room. That's right. There, there we you go. Are. Look, look at that. Drivers and Validated. mathematics aren't always that strong. <laughs> but, um, I mean, again, it's quite, it's quite easy to build up your experience because there's so many races. Yeah, I think, you know, the format of the championships, it, it, it creates uh, an opportunity. You know, you, you can have a bad qualifying and you can work your way through, or you can have a fantastic race one, have a pickle in race two, and then you could, you know, you've got really good equalisation over the weekend. Everyone has a, a fair stab at the wicket, I feel. So... Yeah, and you can create some fantastic stats. So That's hopefully, right. hopefully, I have some big it's numbers one day. It's a statistician's dream. Absolutely, think, that's a good word. That. I like that. No, so, uh, <laughs> I've been practicing that one. The, uh, but the other side of it, Mark, I always think I always look when when I was running drivers, especially when they were new to the championship, I would always say, don't look at it as three races. Look at it as one race broken into three segments because it's actually you're, because you're always moving forward on the grid try and get in that top twelve for the reverse grid because you could qualify 29th and end up on pole at the end of the day. Yeah, I never experienced that. <laughs> <So. Yeah. laughs> Close at your first one. Yeah, Close at your first one. I, uh, I love the way that it's formatted. I mean, I think sure. it's good for a driver. It's great for the spectators. Uh, it's pure entertainment. And the fact that you get the ballast as uh, the weekend goes through, you know, it starts to equalise a few people out. And the opportunity is always there. But, you know, at the end of the day, touring cars always comes up with a bit of excitement. There's always fireworks. And, you know, it's whether people capitalise on it or whether they can actually, you know, take it and make it run. Jake Hill, our guy, I mean, for me, the last race at Fruxton, in those conditions, with the tyres he was on, was fantastic. It was one of the best races I've seen him do. Um, so I, I don't think anybody can take anything away from hanging on to that throughout the duration of the race. But, you know, people like Dan uh, come back in year two and he's doing a fantastic job. So they're all issues for us. We've got to watch out for guys like this. Yeah. <laughs> He's That's very it. strong on the brakes into that last chicane. He oh, won't yeah. be when he leaves here because I'm tripping him up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I definitely use the right foot for the chicane. That, no, that, was, right. that, was, the, that, was, that was the way. So, Matt, have you got any more stats for us to entertain us? Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, Dan's performance over the, the race weekend. I, I think he was right up there with, with Josh Cook with his two wins and with Jake Hill with his three podiums in terms of how he performed over the weekend because, um, you know, he's, he's coming back into the championship he's been out for a season he's gone in with a frontline team and that really raises the pressure in terms of what people are going to expect from him on track and he did a really really good job he, he got his elbows out and he picked up some good results over the course of the weekend and I, I think it shows the progress he's already making that in the first race at Thruxton he scored more points in that one race than he'd scored in the 30 races that he'd taken part in previously in the championship so a really good start for Dan and something for him now to build on going forwards. Josh Cook, as I mentioned, two race wins for him was a, a great way to start the season. And had it not been for the, the penalty he got ahead of race three and then the changeable weather conditions, he might well have come out of the weekend leading the championship ahead of Jake. But all told, you know, another two wins for him at, at Thruxton. He really loves that circuit. He's actually scored 60% of his career race wins in the BTCC at Thruxton which is his home circuit. He knows it very, very well. And he's now second uh, or joint second on the list of winners at Thruxton all time. So we go back there later in the season. If he can get another win there, he'd go into equal first place. So that's something for him to, uh, something for him to aim for. Um, Ash Sutton, as I mentioned, he was a race winner. He became the 49th driver to win a race at Thruxton. So obviously it's also the first win for Infinity. Um, Dan Camish, he was back for Thruxton. Just a one-off because, of course, he's already committed to the Porsche Carrera Cup this season. He was drafted in to replace Michael Kreese. He picked up 30 points over the course of the weekend. That's a good point score in itself. But if you look at drivers through the years who've dropped into the championship and done a one-off round, stacks up particularly well. You've got to go back to 2010 when Fabrizio Giovanardi did the first round at Thruxton with Triple Eight and scored 38 points to find a driver who scored that many points in a one-off outing. I think Rob Huff was the only person who got close to him. A few years ago, he came in for Palmax Racing at Silverstone, scored about 26, 27 points. So... That's good for Dan. And actually, the 30 points he scored there would have put him in the top 20 in the championship last season. So it, it kind of shows that you can do a lot from one race weekend in the championship. Well, the good news for Dan and the other Honda runners is that Thruxton 
is a Honda circuit and we go back to Thruxton later in the year for the first time we're going back there for, for two rounds. So is that looking strong for the Honda point of view, do you think, Dan? I think so. You know, I think the car is really, really suited. But, you know, as we could see, Jake's Ford was doing a pretty good job as well. So I think there's, there's as the cars are getting newer, people are get into the, maybe the latter part of the envelope for NGTC now, you know, people sort of know a good baseline where to put the car in. And you can put a pretty good, oh, even the Cooper car looked good with Jack off in it, didn't it? So, you know, I think everyone's expectation of the cars has moved forward, you know, so, but for sure, we're excited to go back because we know our car's really, really good at Thruxton. So, Definitely. yeah, fantastic, yeah. So before we go back to Thruxton, we're going to be going to Snetterton. Mark, that would be your local circuit, really, is it, for where you're up in Cambridge? So it's not too far away across the borders of Norfolk. What are your memories of Snetterton? Not just touring cars, but in previous times oh, Listen, as well. Snetterton's a great circuit. Uh, I've had some big results there over the years. Um, and, you know, one of the places where I started my Formula 4 career to a certain extent, I think it was my third or fourth race out. And also the home of Van Diemen, Ralph Furman. You know, he's had some great drivers over the years, the likes of Senna and Guzman, my old teammate as well. Um, so yeah, touring cars going back there will always be entertaining. I'm no doubt the next round will be very entertaining. We hope to be at the front, obviously, but um, as I say, we've got guys like Dan knocking around that are uh, going to be strong competitors. And have you got any stats, Matt, for specific for Snetterton? Well, it's funny that you mentioned there how strong Honda have been at Thruxton. We know that for a fact, but actually, if you look at the stats for Snetterton from the past, it actually bodes quite well for Dan and for Mark as we go there, because Ford and Honda, as manufacturers, are the two manufacturers that have got the most wins at Snetterton in the past. Ford have got 18, the last one, of course, coming last season with Ollie Jackson. So, you know, Ford, the motor-based package, we know that's going to be strong there. And Honda, just behind on 17. The FK8s won there as well. Their last win for the car was the Diamond Double victory with Matt Neal a few years back. So... Could be an interesting little battle there between Motorbase, MB Motorsport and Dynamics and, of course, BTC Racing to, uh, to see which one of those can come out on top. And in terms of drivers, the three drivers who've won the most races at Snetterton are all going to be on the grid. Jason Plato's got 13 wins, Colin Turkington's got seven, Gordon Shedden's got six. So those three kind of looking for bragging rights to see if they can stay right up there as well. Well, that's great to hear. So no pressure, guys. Looking for podiums all round. So thanks very much for joining us for the first ever Pitch BTCC show. Let's see if some of those stats come to fruition. Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm here with Dan Rowbottom, who's the Team Halfords with Cataline Driver in the British Touring Car Championship, who had a great weekend at Thruxton. Following on from Thruxton, we're at Snetterton next time, and what that means is we can have some fans back. There's only 4,000 of you, but it'd be great to see you there, having not had any fans for over a year and a half now at some of the racing circuits in the UK. What we have is the Pitch BTCC app, which allows you to get in and amongst what's going on at a British Touring Car Weekend. And one way of doing that is downloading the app and getting onto the pit time section to ask your questions to the drivers. So we've got one car left on the grid with a seat to fill. Who is that one driver, past or present, that you would put in to that final BTCC seat? Jay, that's an easy one. It's got to be Abby Eaton from the Grand Tour. She'd fill that seat. What bit is it that you miss the most about not being at a BTCC meeting? The greasy burgers. Another feature of the Pitch BTCC app is a chance to win a special hoodie signed by all the drivers, so it doesn't get any more special than that. What you need to do is make your prediction of who's going to get the podiums across the whole weekend and across the whole year in the British Touring Car Championship. The person who scores the most points wins the hood. As we head towards Snetterton, there's one change on the grid. Senna Proctor replaces Dan Kamish in the BTC Racing Honda. So that's another quick driver on the grid in a quick car. So be looking forward to see how he gets on. He couldn't get to the first race because his 
girlfriend, Katie, has just had a baby. Little baby Sophia was born on the Thursday before uh, the British Touring Car Race at Thruxton, so good luck to them. Mum and baby are doing fantastically well. So heading towards Snetterton, I'm going to ask Dan Robottom what he thinks is going to be happening on the second circuit from his race seat, but also from the other guys. So heading towards Snetterton, which is actually a, quite a technical circuit. For sure, yeah. What, what, what do you, what do you, how do you plan for a race weekend? Well, we were fortunate to get some testing at Snetterton. It was actually the start of our testing program, our winter testing program. It was my first day in the FK, or first two days in the FK. Um, went really, really well. So we've got a good sort of base level understanding of the track, what we want from the car there. I do a little bit of sim work at home. I've built myself one of those rigs. Everyone got carried away last year during lockdown, so I spent way too much money on a rig. But anyway, yeah, same much, here. Much, same to the, here. much to the wife's <laughs> displeasure. Um, so I do a bit of that, a bit of bike riding, get on my push bike as much as I can, try and keep some weight off. Uh, Gordon, as we mentioned about Gordon, he's very, very professional and very, very light. So uh, I'm not winning in that department. So um, just try and uh, I just try and keep my mind clear. You know, there's a lot of other stuff that has to go on between race race meetings. So. We're always looking at commercial opportunities as well for, for all the partners and we're doing bits and pieces with Halfords and with Cataclean and trying to make all that. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that I think perhaps people don't always think about. But for me, you know, that the, we're into this part of the season now, so the job is let's get, you know, let's get a good set of results in. I want three strong races and, you know, we were quite close to a podium in race two at Thruxton, so I can smell it now, so I want to try and get back there. Well, that's right. I mean, because really, you, you touched on it slightly there. There's, it's very expensive running a British touring car. Of course. And the money's got to come from somewhere. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and you'll find that every driver has a different story about how it's all put together, but you're all aiming for the, the same end target. Yeah, I think so. You know, for, for me, the, the BTCC has been the, the only place that I could raise a, a commercial budget, really. It's the only thing that has a justifiable and quantifiable result from the end of it you know we've got a fantastic tv package we have shows like this that are running all the time you know we have lots and lots of social media interaction so you can quantify the investment plus from from my perspective i have a partner in cataclean that have got a physical product that they can sell it happens to be an automotive product and we're in an automotive landscape so that's even better so you know for for, for me the 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 big opportunity with the team's amex drive wasn't just to sit in a fantastic car it was to sit head and shoulders with with Halfords you know and Halfords are our, our leading retailer for the you know for the consumer market Cataclean's available in lots and lots of places for the trade but you know in terms of where you you or I off the street would go Halfords is the main place so you have to think of all these different things and not just myself all the drivers have got their own little commercial deals going on and everyone's a little bit stressed and you know it's it's difficult but ultimately very very re rewarding you know I think back eight or nine years when I wasn't racing because I didn't have the finances to do it. I don't think that I'd have been, I didn't think, I don't think I dreamt of having a commercial package like I have now. And it's really exciting because you're working with some big companies, some big people, you know, with, with, with Cataclysm, we've got, we've got a, a little giant waiting in the wings. You know, it's such a good business and, and there's never been a more prominent time with the way the world looks now with emissions and, and, and sustainability. So we've got this such an exciting time period for, for our, for my title sponsor that, you know, the racing is, is, Although it's primary, sometimes it becomes a secondary thought, you know, because when you get to a weekend, it's when you relax, you put your helmet on and go, oh, I can do the job now. That's right. Know, so. Well, it's, it's actually probably just as competitive off the track as it is sure. on the track. For sure. I mean, I, it's, it's slightly shark infested waters in the BTCC paddock <laughs> because everybody, uh, it always seems to be the case that people aren't usually looking outside of the paddock to get sponsors. They're yeah. usually looking inside to try and nick everybody mm -hmm. else's. Unfortunately, I think that, that therein lies a serious problem, you know, because it, it's a damn sight easier to let somebody else do all the hard work and get the carrot dangled and then just go and pinch that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm very fortunate, you know, my guys are very, very loyal. You know, the guys at Cataclean have been with me, we are entering our fifth year together. Mm. Um, some drivers aren't so fortunate, you know, they have relationships that are maybe a, a new or they're still in their conception stages and you do find people swooping in. So it's something that grates a little bit for me because without the support of a external uh, sponsor, I couldn't go motor racing. So. I do feel for the drivers that fall foul of it, you know. Um, I'm not going to say we haven't had a few people try and uh, try and land land the hook, you know, in some of my partners' uh, ponds. But you know, I'm doing a good job, so we just have to, you know. Ultimately, it comes down to results. You know, my guys are very clear. You can go racing if you sell product. Simple as that. That's yeah. that's it. So um, 
I just have to keep selling product. So talking about other drivers and other teams on the grid, as we head towards Snetterton, what are your thoughts? I mean, yes, obviously from your point of view, you, you want to win all the races and go <laughs> yeah, home with maximum points. Yeah. But, but who do you think is going to be strong at Snetterton? You know, I, I think the problem is in BTCC now. We could we could list 20 drivers, you know, because the, the grid is so closely condensed. But I think for sure, Tom Ingram, Jason Plato, Ashley Sutton, Gordon Shedden, I'd like to think myself, Jake Hill, Josh Cook, you know, the list is endless, you know, and without, I don't want to offend any drivers by not mentioning the name, but, you know, I really think there's, there's 15 people that can compete for podiums, genuinely, probably 20 people that can compete for points every race. So it's, 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 you know, it's very, very fraught. You know, you've got teams that have taken on new cars, they're still learning these cars, so, and they're going to come on stronger and stronger as the season progresses. Snetterton's a different type of circuit of Thruxton, as you know, it suits other cars, so, I think it's going to throw a little bit of a mix out there, but for sure the big names, you know, Turkington, I haven't even mentioned Colin Turkington, he's always there or thereabouts, isn't he? Tom Oliphant and Stephen Jelly as well is very competitive in the BMW now. So it really is, a, a, let's just flip a coin, shall we? But, yeah, you know, that's, right. I, it, it, that's what makes championships so great. You can't really predict it. And I think I think this is one of the races where we go there and we have a top 10 shootout in qualifying as well. So yes. run me through that, how that works. I'll be honest, I've not read the regulation. I, it was only brought to my attention the other day. So I think they did it in 2020. Yeah. As you know, I was on a sabbatical last year, so I, I better go and read the regs. I don't, I can't explain it to you. I it makes know. it quite exciting because <laughs> you have a slightly shorter section yes. and then you have a final five minutes I'm or 10 minutes. Believe, and that sorts thing, out the top like, 10, is that yes, right? Yes, that's Something right. Like that. But yeah. I, I really like it. I think it's For quite sure. exciting. It sure. won't work at every circuit because of the timetable and things, but it just adds an added dimension. Well, rolling back the years, just talking to qualifying things, back in karting, we used to do three lap qualifying at one stage. They tr they trialled and it was like you had one fast lap, you'd go out and warm your tyres up, you had to do your lap and then lap three you came in. So these shootouts can be exciting, you know, very mm. exciting. No, yeah. definitely. I mean, there's a lot of strategy involved as well as, sure. as what the drivers can do. But so on that note, what we're looking at doing now is looking forward to Snetterton, um, which could be exciting. We'll be there over the weekend. If any of the fans want to come and say hi, make sure you download the Pitch BTCC app. Get a chance to get on the pit time graphics, maybe. Maybe get a chance to win a Pitch BTCC hoodie at the end of the season. And you could be alongside this man up on the podium when we come to Brands Hatch at the end of the year. Looking forward to Snetterton, seeing what that brings. Looking forward to seeing you again on the Pitch BTCC show after the event. Mm -hmm.